welcome. We're going to go ahead and get started here. I'm Suzanne Wunz. I'm the Executive Director of the Harvard Law School Library. And on behalf of the library, I'd like to thank you all very much for coming out for this talk. I'm sorry we uh, knew it would be very popular, but uh, underestimated a little bit on the seating and food. So thank you all for coming. And um, we'll make up for it with a really great talk. Um, so the talk, of course, today is about uh, Professor Cass Sunstein's latest book, Valuing Life, um, Humanizing the Regulatory State. And uh, we're very excited to hear about it. It's a really remarkable book. And uh, Professor Sunstein is the Robert Walmsley University professor. And of course, from 2009 to 2012, he ran the White House Office of Information and Regulatory, Regulatory Affairs, uh, which informs a lot of this book. So we're really looking forward to this talk. And joining Professor Sunstein, we have uh, Professor Edward Glazer from the Harvard Kennedy School. Professor Glazer is the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics, as well as the director of the Taubman Center for State and Local Government. And he's also the director of the Rappaport Institute of Greater Boston. And from the Harvard Law School, we also have Professor John Coates, the John F. Kogan Jr. Professor of Law and Economics, and also the research director for the program on the legal profession. Uh, I would also just like to mention really quickly that uh, the event is being taped. So if there's any time for questions at the end, and if you have questions, those will be part of the recording. Um, and with that, I will hand it right over to Professor Sunstein. So I'm amazed that uh, there's so many people here. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, there's a one-year-old who had unbelievable LSAT scores who's here and I think has broken the record for the youngest Harvard, Harvard Law student. Uh, these remarks are actually relevant to him or her, him, her to her. Okay. Okay. So uh, my focus is on uh, the hardest problem I think that regulators who are concerned with social welfare face. Uh, they face a lot of hard problems. I'm going to focus on the very hardest. Uh, it's the problem of non-quantifiability. And to orient it, let's just set get a, a set of cases in view. Um, the Department of Transportation fairly recently finalized a rule involving putting cameras in cars so people can see in back of the cars. And the challenge of that rule is that the monetized costs are just higher than the monetized benefits. It's a pretty expensive rule, several hundred millions of dollars. Uh, some lives are going to be saved. But if you turn this into monetary equivalence, it just isn't worth it. And the President of the United States has said that agencies should proceed to the extent permitted by law only if the benefits justify the costs, and they don't seem to. The trick in the case is that there are benefits which the agency considered non-quantifiable, including the anguish that parents feel if they end up running over their own kids. It's about the worst anguish you can imagine. And uh, they didn't know how to handle that non-quantifiable value, but they didn't ignore it. A uh, second case involves prison rape. There's a rule that was finalized by the Department of Justice not very long ago, uh, which is supposed to reduce the incidence of prison rape. It will certainly do that. It will also cost several hundred million do millions of dollars. How do we value the reduction in rapes in prison? A uh, third case, improved technology at airports, which is uh, not an uncommon event the last years, uh, which are going to cost more money um, for the uh, people who run them, the airport operators and possibly the airlines. Uh, how much do we value that? Uh, if we are built, making buildings accessible for disabled people so they can use bathrooms on their own, uh, what kind of quantification is feasible even for that? Uh, Professor Coates has written extremely well and illuminatingly on the problem of quantification for financial regulation. And he rightly says that in some contexts, it is extremely daunting, maybe impossible, for regulators to come up with monetary equivalents. OK, there are three versions of the objection to quantification, I think, three faces for the non-quantifiability concern. The first is epistemic. It's the sheer lack of information. We might not know either the quantity of the good thing that the regulation is going to give us, how many people are going to be helped by a prison rape regulation. Is it one or is it 2,000? We may not know. 
we may not know either how to turn the benefit into monetary equivalents. So if we have a rule that saves, let's say, a dozen children from being run over because the car was difficult to see in back of for the driver, you turn that into dollars. Even if you know the number of kids who are going to be okay. saved, that's a challenge. There's a second objection to, non -quantif to quantification, which is that it might not be the right basis for policy. So we might think that the tool we have, which is standardly the willingness to pay tool, isn't the appropriate tool for evaluating a good that involves, say, human dignity. And that's a second objection. The third, which I think is the most interesting objection, points to incommensurability. Here we have a passage from John Stuart Mill, uh, who didn't have uh, full agreement with, in some ways, his intellectual mentor, Jeremy Bentham, urging that Bentham missed qualitative differences among human goods, saying that Bentham faintly recognizes as a fact in human nature the pursuit of any other ideal end for its own sake, uh, the sense of honor and personal dignity, that feeling of personal value, exaltation and degradation which acts independently of other people's opinion, when you feel deeply proud of yourself or deeply ashamed of yourself. Um, the love of beauty, the passion of the artist, the love of order, of congruity, of consistency. Bentham doesn't get that. He kind of reduces them all to a single metric. This is Mill's um, ambivalence about utilitarianism. And it's a claim really can be understood as a claim about one form of quantification. Okay, I think Mill's claim is deeply true but largely irrelevant. So it's the most interesting of the three objections, but it's the, uh, the, the least helpful. Uh, the reason is the trade-offs are inevitable, and to engage in the enterprise of quantification, we're not providing a full or deep understanding of the goods, we're just trying to figure out how to make, tra make trade-offs among them. So my focus is on lack of knowledge. It's that we don't know relevant numbers. Okay, here's a rabbit coming out of the hat. And uh, I certainly didn't invent it. It's a tool that the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs has um, endorsed. Uh, and the goal is to try to make some progress on it. The tool, and there's an ultimate prize, which I'll disclose at the end. Not the one of you is going to get it. There's an intellectual prize that this is trying to uh, point toward. Okay, the break-even analysis says, basically, what would the benefits have to be to justify proceeding? So the notion is, in a case, and this is just a stylized version, where we know the cost is, say, $500 million, and we have some uh, informational deficit, what would the quantified numbers have to be in order for the thing to go forward? That's break-even analysis. And the suggestion is, it's kind of mundane and homely, as the idea sounds, it really provides a way forward in extremely difficult settings. So this is a helpful rabbit that provides orientation where we might otherwise be stuck. And what I'm going to do now is to suggest three ways that the break-even analysis might turn out to be helpful with decreasing order of confidence on my part. So we'll start where it works best and end up where it works least well. Okay, the first is areas where we are able to identify floors and ceilings or lower bounds and upper bounds. So we might be very challenged in knowing how many prison rapes you're going to prevent by a prison rape rule, but you might know it's going to prevent at least this many. You might have a lower bound. If you have that, you're on the way home because you might be able to say something about what the minimum monetary value of prison rape is. And once you do the multiplication exercise, then you have a simple lower bound, which would make the thing worthwhile if the lower bound is higher than the expected costs. So the simple idea is this is like a, a small engine, like a toy, that can be used to help in a lot of very hard cases. So for a disability rule, you might know the number of disabled people who are helped by a rule that gives them, let's say, an opportunity to study law is X. That if the value of their opportunity to study law is Y, if you multiply those two together and they're kind of lowballing both ends, then if the cost is lower than that, we're completely home. 
And you can do it on the ceiling side too. If you know that there's a water body that will be protected by a Clean Water Act rule, and it's only one water body, and the magnitude of the value that you get from the rule is at most x, then you multiply one times x, and if the cost exceeds that, then it just isn't worthwhile. So lower bounds and upper bounds are uh, are often available, and and they can help make decisive break-even analysis. Now, notice this can work either if the challenge to quantification is on the pre-monetary side or on the monetary side. So we might know what the magnitude of the pre-monetary good is, access to bathrooms, prison rapes avoided. We might not know how to turn that into monetary equivalents, but we might have a sense of what the lower value would be of those things, and then the, the little toy provides some help. Or we might know the monetary value is at least this for, for these things, and the quantity is at least that for these things, and then we're home. Okay, that's the first suggestion, and it's the most uh, simple and orderly way of making the non-quantifiable uh, analysis possible because of the break-even approach. Okay, the second idea is that if we lack floors or ceilings based on evidence, which is what I've been discussing, we might be able to use comparison cases to make progress. So the Environmental Protection Agency has a bunch of values for things, of which kind of the most prominent is the valuation of, of a statistical life, which is about $9 million. And that's in the ballpark of government-wide valuation. Now, if you're getting stuck on that, it might be for good reasons. Uh, see if this helps get you unstuck. It's just a question. If you are asked how much would you be willing to pay to eliminate a mortality risk of 1 in 100,000 that you face now, how much would you pay? If we did this as a contingent valuation study in this room, it wouldn't be at all surprising if the median or average answer was $90. And if so, that's kind of tracking what the technocrats do, either on the contingent valuation side or in the actual market behavior study side, to give a value to statistical life. It's not really a value of a life. It's a value of a statistical mortality risk. And if you're willing to pay $1,000 to eliminate a risk of 1 in 100,000, chances are you're very rich. Most people aren't willing to spend that much. Okay, the simple point is if we have comparison cases with established values, then we have um, uh, a method for thinking through cases where quantification is otherwise challenging. If there's a risk that's of uh, difficulty that a disabled person faces in a bathroom, that cannot I suggest, be valued at $9 million. That would be implausible to suggest that it's equivalent to a, a mortality risk. And then we can think about other cases to which it might be comparable. Okay, the hardest cases are ones where knowledge is really, really sparse. And here cases are, this is a technical term, really, really hard. <laughs> and the idea here is that the best that can be done is a kind of conditional justification in which a regulator says that the thing is worth doing only if it is conditionally understood to be valued X, and we just don't know. It could be half X, it could be double X, and there the agency's break-even analysis isn't doing decisional work. It's basically giving a sense of transparency and a plea for more information gathering. The book is a little stuck on how to handle this case. My only suggestion is this case is hard and um, not embarrassingly hard. There's just an epistemic gap. And to give a conditional justification of the sort sketched is a lot better than not doing that because at least the public knows the premises on which the thing would be justified or not. If you had something else, you would have a failure of accountability. Okay, let's now get down to cases and I'm just gonna discuss a few. In the rear visibility case, uh, one of the most poignant cases that the government has dealt with, I think, in the last decade, uh, there was a shortfall of approximately $200 million. 
And what the Department of Transportation said is, look, there are other values that the rule is pr protecting, protecting very little kids, who are the plurality of the deaths involved, protecting parents against the anguish of their own involvement in their kid's death, and also increasing ease and simplification of driving. We don't know how to value that, but it's easier to drive if you can see in back of you. For those who have a car with a camera in back, you can see that this has some sort of value for people, quite apart from the actual accidents averted. Okay, the Department of Transportation didn't say much more than what I just said, and my suggestion is it should have been more disciplined in its analysis in the way that I'm um, trying to sketch. So if we stipulate that 60,000 cars would be equipped with cameras that wouldn't otherwise be equipped with cars, then if we give a quite low value for the ease and simplification of driving per car, we've almost swallowed up the shortfall right there. It's not crazy to value this at $30 per car, is it? We'd want to know whether that's random or founded in something. But it's not a crazy lower bound. And if we do that, then we're pretty much eating up the, the shortfall already. Then we have to ask how to value someone who's two years old <coughs> as opposed to the population median. And there's data suggesting that the valuation should be a lot higher, <coughs> either if you include the parents' valuation of their small children's lives or if you find some way to capture the welfare benefit to the kid staying alive. And now we're getting really close to eating up all of the $200 million, and the break-even analysis is making the thing look pretty good. For access to bathrooms, there was also, let's stipulate, roughly a $200 million shortfall. Then we'd have to ask, for each disabled person, how much would it, they be willing to pay for per visit? in order to visit without having to, to use the bathroom without having to ask a colleague for help. And it turns out that if the number is really small for part of the relevant rule about $2 for another five cents, then it survives break-even analysis. The five cent one is pretty plainly justified on that ground. The $2 one we'd have to new, do some more thinking, but we're already in the ballpark of, of making analysis more tractable. Prison rape is the uh, um, uh, maybe the most challenging case in million terms for doing any kind of cost-benefit analysis. But to those who think, as a prominent law professor has urged, not at this institution, but a prominent and very good institution, uh, who's urged that uh, the cost-benefit analysis is where prison rape jumped the shark, where, where cost-benefit analysis jumped the shark. Do you know the reference? It's from the old TV show Happy Days. There's a terrible episode where Fonzie, who's supposed to be the coolest person who solves all problems, jumps over some shark in order to show his coolness and mastery, and it's completely embarrassing and ridiculous. So jumping the shark is when something that's maybe okay completely discredits itself. So maybe cost-benefit analysis jumps the shark here. I don't think so because there are multiple possible levels of stringency that any prison rape rule can have, and any judgment about the level of stringency that's the justified one must depend, mustn't it, on some pl implicit assignment of value to risk reduction. And so the Department of Justice did engage in cost-benefit analysis of the break-even sort. Now what it tried to do, and I think this is the right track, was to say, what is a reasonable number of prison rapes that we're going to reduce? And what is a reasonable lower bound va value for the prison rapes? And it turns out, if you prevent a very, very small fraction of the quarter million plus prison rapes that occur in the United States, and if you lowball the value of the prison rape, it's well justified. Now, to get the analysis full, you'd want to look at the maybe five or six possible levels of stringency for a prison rape rule and look at the expected prison rape di diminution that you get from each level of stringency, kind of just run the numbers. But in terms of a justification of what was chosen, this is looking uh, pretty reasonable. Okay, final financial regulation is sometimes very hard, not always. It's hard, especially in cases where we're dealing with the risk of a financial meltdown, as the government is sometimes doing, by trying to reduce 
of the danger. There are two questions that should be asked and probably must be being asked implicitly. What is the cost of a meltdown? And what is the contribution of this rule to preventing a meltdown? Kind of an expected value. And both of those questions may be very, very hard to answer. But if the cost of a meltdown has a lower bound of, let's say, $150 billion, and if it plausibly decreases the risk of a meltdown by a lower bound of 150, 1 over 150, then a billion dollar expenditure is worthwhile. Now, the challenge for this kind of case is that both of those numbers may be uh, arbitrary, in which case we're in my third box, remember? The third box of the conditional justification without clarity about whether the conditions are met. Okay, what's the point of all this? I'm almost done, but here, here's the point. Uh, social welfare, in the sense of human consequences, should be the driver of our regulatory decision making. Too often, at least in the past, I think decreasingly, but too often anecdotes, dogmas, interest groups, they have been the drivers. And if we're insistent on some form of quantified analysis, it's because we're trying to get a grip on the human effects of what we're doing. And that's, you know, that's important. The stakes are pretty high. If people are privileged as I was to serve the American people, you ought to be focused every second of every day on making sure the consequences of what you're doing in that second are positive. And this is a way to do that. We should aspire, I suggest, to more than what OMB Circular A4, which is the kind of Bible of cost-benefit analysis, uh, does honor, which is professional judgment. Should aspire to more than that, because in areas that include the environment, disability, and highway safety, professional judgment is often some kind of intuition, which isn't based on a keen, sense of the human consequences. It's based more on a feeling or an example or some recent failure that makes the professional deem regulation or non-regulation or a moderate step or an aggressive step desirable. Okay. The point is that non-quantifiable values play a big role in a lot of government's domains, in foreign policy, enforcement activity by the Department of Justice, judgments about decisions, judgments by entrepreneurs. Often decisions are being made without precise information about how to quantify or monetize important variables. The largest claim is that in ordinary life, people are making decisions about how to trade off an assortment of values, many of which defy quantification. If that doesn't happen for any of us in the next 48 hours, we'll have been an unusual 48 hours. And in some of those decisions, maybe all of them, break-even analysis is at least implicitly at work, and uses of lower and upper bounds are common, even if implicit. That means, and here's the effort at, a, at a, a something seen through a glass darkly, break-even analysis is not limited to the regulatory context. It's a crucial aspect of practical reason in multiple areas of human life. Thanks. Thank you, Cass. Thanks for the opportunity to comment on the talk and the book um, and for a continuing dialogue on this overall topic, which I agree is first order important and one that you know, frankly, more about than almost anyone. Um, the book covers more than Cass covered in the talk. I commend it to you. Um, it's a rich and very illuminating blend example of the hermeneutic, her, hermeneutic circle of theory and practice, right? So Cass thinks a lot about these issues very theoretically, talks to people who speak in numerical formulas that the rest of us can't understand. I'm gesturing at Ed. Um, and then he goes and works 
at the ground level in a government agency trying to apply the theory and comes back with both problems and insights and challenges. And so for that reason alone, the book is worth a, a close read. It's also incredibly honest and transparent and clear, um, both about the limits and the advantages of cost-benefit analysis as applied in the settings that Cass has worked in. Um, and, and then, and then I'm, I have to say at least one critical thing. So I'm going to end by combining those two points and say any book that is deeply informed by theory and practice about a very difficult topic and is also honest and transparent ends up being incoherent. Um, <laughs> in a good way, um, in a thought-provoking way. And so it's full of places where it's at war with itself. Um, and I, I, again, I commend the book to you for that reason alone. Uh, you will learn by thinking through the gaps and the connections. And I say this with all sympathy. I come out of practice myself, and when I teach and write with my academic colleagues about topics I used to work on, I find myself completely uh, incoherent at times. Um, so um, two quick words about each of those things. So on the um, uh, transparency, clarity, and showing you the practice at work, um, OIRA, which Cass ran, is, of course, the engine of cost-benefit analysis in the government. And one of the principal reasons that it is justified in its origin and its continuation and its ever-expanding attempts to reach into all parts of our government is that it enhances transparency and makes it easier for the public to understand the regulatory process, and that's something that Cass alluded to. But there's a, a peculiar feature of it, which is that it operates um, in private. Uh, that is to say, most of the way that IRA actually does its work is largely not transparent to the public because it's, I think, generally understood that for there to be honest and candid uh, expert deliberation over cost-benefit analysis, if you know that you're doing that in public, that will tend to affect the way people talk with each other, tend to make them more cautious, tend to make them less able to say things that um, might not turn out to be true in reflection, but which in the moment might advance the analysis. So a large part of judgment um, as applied in the cost-benefit area is opaque, and Cass's book is very helpful in opening up the curtain a little bit in very specific examples, many of which um, are quite revealing, I think, of the way cost-benefit analysis is actually applied. Um, and I'm going to take just a couple um, to link to the second point, which is um, the, uh, the sort of theoretical elements of the book. Um, and, and, one's, and I'm going to use a very simple, one of the simplest, in fact, things that he talks about, which is discount rates, how to think about discounting future benefits and costs. And you all know, if any of you have been exposed to this sort of thing, that there's a great deal of judgment that goes into choosing the rate at which one discounts any particular future payoff, whether in terms of welfare or money. Um, the government, uh, you may be surprised to know, has decided that there are two and only two discount rates that we should use in this area, and they should be fixed. And they have been fixed by intergovernmental process, 3% or 7%, depending on which category you're in. You might be able to get away with something in between, but what you can't do, and, and Cass says this very explicitly on page 62, if an agency comes to our IR and says, we think in this case the discount rate should be 2%, and they might even have a good reason for it, um, this argument would be unsuccessful, meaning they won't get through the process. Now, to anybody in my world, which is finance, financial regulation, the idea that the government will determine the discount rate that's, that's, that's useful uh, for understanding the human consequences of actions at any given point in time is a little odd because, of course, discount rates change dramatically in practice uh, when people are doing that sort of thing outside the government. So currently the discount rate that anybody would use for a relatively safe investment would not probably, it would probably be very close to zero. Um, uh, Alibaba, which just went public, is sweeping up money in China by offering uh, 3%, um, just massively growing its assets, because no one in the world is offering 3% on safe assets right now. So that's just a, a feature of the institutional context in which this policy analysis is placed. And just to play that a little bit more, the FSA in England uses different rates 
uh, the, uh, the banking committee that sort of coordinates among central banks around the world uses yet other discount rates. They're also fixed. Um, so you get these highly arbitrary choices of a very important input which can swing the bottom line, at least in the areas that I know about <laughs> financial regulation, by 100 or 200 percent of the net cost or benefit derived through the process, which is to say those arbitrary choices determine the outcome if the outcome is viewed as an up or down decision on the rule. If it's not viewed as an up or down decision on the rule, then while I agree completely we should aspire to more than intuition, uh, nevertheless, we're left with, at the end of the day, intuition. Now, it's constrained intuition. It's intuition that will have to be um, exercised within some plausible range. And that's, I take it, the main thrust of the analysis, the break-even analysis that Cass went through. It constrains our judgment, but at the end of the day, at least in many areas of regulation, it will still be highly judgmental. Now, it doesn't mean you shouldn't do the cost-benefit analysis, but it does mean that when you're thinking about, for example, uh, judicial review of the analysis by an agency, you should think differently than you would if you thought judgment was not playing a significant role in the analysis. And that's something that comes out of the book indirectly, uh, but Cass and Adrian, who's standing in the back, have written about this much more trenchantly in other articles. And so if you're going to read this book, go read that other article too, because this is a law school and you need to understand not only the policy set up, but the institutional context in which it's going to be played out. Um, and I'll end just with two other remarks about financial regulation. Cass alluded to this. Um, financial regulation, not just sometimes, but I would submit to you always, in any important financial regulation, it is going to involve low risk events, you know, low likelihood events, about which it's therefore very difficult to derive empirical estimates of people's willingness to pay to avoid, which is something he candidly acknowledges in the book. It's also almost always going to involve uh, significant externalities, uh, things that are not part of the normal market structure, the allowing for inferences or safe inferences about, about uh, how much people are willing to pay to avoid these risks in practice. And you put those two things together, and that means, I think, we might actually believe our current setup, which does not mandate cost-benefit analysis for financial regulation, for the most part, um, might be a sensible place to stay, at least until we do better at generating data and inferences in those areas. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I, I also enjoyed the book greatly, and I commend it to you uh, uh, warmly. I, it also is full of the both intellectual fizz and wisdom that we've all come to expect, expect from uh, from Cass, and it was really a great pleasure for me to, me to read it. And I think one of the things you should start out with on this is to recognize that the tools of cost-benefit analysis are by no means just about regulation, right? Um, as an economist who studies cities, right, I, I think of, you know, when I think about errors and failures of cost benefit analysis, I think first of all of white elephant projects like the Detroit People Mover Monorail that could have used a good dose of cost benefit analysis before $300 million was spent on this idiocy. Um, but it's everywhere, and I would, I would argue that almost, you know, even in areas in which cost benefit analysis is completely foreign to the American tradition, like, for example, uh, foreign policy, like wars, right? Injecting a bit more quantification, like, for example, into Bill, Mrs. and Joe Stiglitz's attempts to, to quantify the cost of the war would have been helpful ex ante. That, in fact, avoiding those numbers is not a recipe for holistic, wise decision-making that incorporates everything. It's a recipe for often wild acts of, of folly that actually forcing yourself to put numbers on uh, is very, very helpful. Uh, I think I, I also probably should highlight and I, I, uh, that there's a distinction between what OIRA does and what the final decision makers do, right, in some sense. So OIRA has its set amount of legal powers, but as I understand it, if, if Congress wanted to overrule you in some way, they had every, they have every ability to do, to do so. So even we can differentiate between things that we should think should be in any competent cost benefit analysis versus things that should ultimately guide the nation. So to take, to take a couple of examples from the book, um, acting on wildly irrational fears of the public. 
I basically think that OIRA should not be in internalizing wildly irrational fears of the public, no matter what. Uh, uh, and in part, it's because the people who ultimately make decisions already do far too much of that. Right? So it's not that I disagree with the point that's made in the book, which is, look, if people are wildly irrationally frightened of, you know, the uh, deadly squirrel disease that is allegedly roaming around, and I read it on the internet, so it must be true, uh, then it's, you know, it may in fact be appropriate for a, a elected official to say we're going to clap down on this deadly squirrel thing and take some actions to 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 uh, reduce public anxiety about it, but I just don't want cost-benefit analysis or OIRA soiled by by its engagement with uh, engagement with uh, with this. Um, and uh, yes, now I think the area where I probably um, disagree most, or or uh, disagree most, is not the right state that I that I would have been much tougher. Is I guess I don't see nearly as much range for things that are non-quantifiable. And that perhaps shouldn't surprise anyone, as I am indeed an economist, so I believe in this stuff. But I believe that there are tons of things which are incredibly poorly measured. That is certainly true, right? Including, for example, the net benefits of going to war, whatever the heck they were, right? I mean, I, I don't, even if we can measure the cost, the net benefits are just enormously poorly measured. And maybe you get to a point in which the measurement error is so huge that it's just worthwhile giving up. But I don't see how you can do that if you've got to make a decision at the end of the day. Um, so... Uh, there are times, and, and Cass is, of course, right about this, where break-even analysis means that you've reduced the informational need slightly, but still, ultimately, you're coming up with an estimate of at least some, as we would say, statistically, some moment of the distribution, like the minimum or some some reasonable value. You're still ultimately trying to uh, quantify it. So I want to make, uh, you know, two two things, and then then I'll I'll stop about the two two claims about this. One of which is there's almost nothing in terms of the examples that he gave, and I could expand it beyond where you can't think, at least in principle, of an exercise which would get you an estimate that you would believe as much as I believe the values of a statistical life. Right? That's that's the first thing. Which is, and the second thing is we should be pretty skeptical about the value of a statistical life, even though we need it. Right? So I'm going to just walk through those things for a second. So, just to take take a clear example, right, and I'm the parent of three kids, so I certainly view running over a kid with horror, but you certainly have lots of ways of potentially estimating how much parents are willing to avoid that risk in other contexts, right? There are an abundance, vast number of products which are being purveyed to parents who are anxious about their children, right? We can see from these things how much parents are willing to pay to do this. This is exactly no different from the logic of saying we're able to observe how much more people need to be paid to take on an added risk of dying, which is ultimately where the market-based tests of a value of statistical life come from. They come from how much people have to be paid to take on added risk. We can also, of course, survey parents, which people do uh, people do as well in terms of these these other areas. Um, so there are certainly ways of getting at this. The the you can imagine there being bathrooms that have more or less access, and you can imagine doing a complicated statistical exercise and ask how much more can restaurants charge that have bathrooms which give better better access. Um, to uh, dignified access to uh, uh, the disabled. The rape issue is harder, harder to know a setting on that. I think you probably get closest by looking at, let's say, for example, property values in areas where the risks of various crimes are higher or lower. Now, this is meant to claim that we can come up with something for everything. As an aside, I think it is, we've probably done ourselves a mistake, those of us who believe strongly in cost-benefit analysis, to then always talk in terms of dollars, because it makes it seem like we're, you know, part of this whole sordid, money-loving thing, whereas, in fact, dollars are serving the use of being a convenient measure of, of account, right, that we can trade one off for the other. So I'm going to humbly propose that we're going to change it to years of pre-K for disadvantaged youths. That that is going to be our new unit of account, and those are going to be, it's, we're going to do that at $10,000 units. So every time you see $10,000, you know, divide that by 10000 and change it into years of pre-K for disadvantaged use. And that's that's going to be our unit of accounts for, uh, for everything. Now, I want to say something about, because just to make it clear how much I believe, you know, in the, in the issues of, of the imprecision of this. So in terms of the surveys, we both have the wild problems of bias, right? The fact that people know that this might be an input to something. So how much do you value each squirrel that's saved? Oh, I value it $3 million, right? The second thing is that once you get to probabilities, human beings are enormously confused about how probabilities work. There is, there is some sense in which we can actually deal with the large-scale events that we deal with in our day, right? The probabilities of, you know, my being late on a, on a given day, I can kind of deal with because I deal with that over and over again. 
But low probability events are both very difficult for people to evaluate in a, if they're being honest, and certainly in the case of, of these hypothetical questions. I'm not surprised that people can't figure out the difference between one in 10,000 and one in 100,000. I mean, these are, these are, you know, very hard things for people to, to grasp. Um, moving straight market data. Remember, when you're getting a market price for something, it is always for the person on the margin. That's Economics 101. So if you're getting a price of someone who's taking on a higher risk job, you're looking at the person who is thinking about that job. You're not thinking, getting at an average person, right? And the person who's thinking about taking a job in which they may fall off a, a girder with some degree of probability is presumably a lot more tolerant of risk than I am, right? This is something that is critical. It's not that the literature is, is unaware of this, but these are hard things to do with. Um, Secondly, it is possible, at least, that attitudes towards risk are not linear in probabilities, right? So the heart of the economic approach says that a 1 in 10,000 chance should be 10 times as valuable or, or uh, uh, costly as a 1 in 100,000 chance. It's unclear if that is not true in practice, and it typically isn't true in practice. It's unclear if that's not true in practice because of something about the, the, or, or the way our preferences work. Or if it's just because guys are confused about probabilities, which again, we'll come back to that, that again. And then another issue I think which is huge is that when thinking about the value of, of a life in lots of areas, there are huge externalities often engaged in this stuff. So, um, if you run over a child, it's not just the parents who suffer, it's the grandparents. It's everyone who knew the kid, right? If, you know, I go up and take a, take a risky action, I, you know, maybe compensated for, for it myself in terms of the wage, but I do damage to you know, my whole social fabric. I do damage to people who I don't necessarily internalize. These are all meant to be reasons why we should be very cautious about this, very wary of the errors that, that exist. But they're not wildly different in all of the settings that were put forward. It's just saying that in some areas you have more errors than others. And as a result, I don't see a hard quantification, non-quantification, that, look, I accept value of statistical life, but I don't accept a value of statistical rape. I, 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 don't, I don't see where there is a 100% right-line rule there. It's just we need to have a, a, you know, a recognition in all cases of the limits of our knowledge. But again, thank you, Cass. Thank you for writing writing another terrific book, and it was great to be here. Maybe I'll just make one quick remark uh, on the discount rate issue. So, so one thing I didn't appreciate before government, so maybe it's good to get this out there, is uh, the reason an agency couldn't revisit the official discount rates um, is that the official discount rates emerged from a process that involved multiple actors within the government and the public comment and peer review. So the th three and seven came from a very arduous uh, process of thinking. And uh, if an agency proposes to have 2% or 8%, say, higher than the three or 7%, it can't do that because there's a, po there's a law-like document there now, that law-like document can be changed through a process, but the process would have to be you know, involving of the same number of people who were involved in the original one. And it, the, the view with, within the government, and this cuts across partisan lines, is 3 and 7 percent are uh, either somewhere between good enough or right. That, that might just be wrong, but the, the response to that would be to change the policy like any other policy that the government has that's embodied in some, in some binding directive. So it's possible in principle that any number of policies that are binding in principle are wrong. And if so, then they should be changed. But that's the point. That is to say, the, the friction of adapting interagency standards over time has to count as a cost of embodying cost-benefit analysis in that institutional framework. And you could, I mean, you could, for example, just say, we're going to get rid of all of those interagency rules. We still want our agencies to do the best they can with cost-benefit analysis. That would be, as you suggest, yeah. a possible thing we could do in law. But that move, I think, would often be perceived as a move away from cost-benefit analysis. And my only point really is to say, no, actually, those are, that's, a diff that's an yeah. orthogonal question. That's a way of embodying the kind of analysis you want to do. Many people who like welfare analysis tend to think that the way we've done it up till now is the best way, and we should just do more of it. And I want to but, strongly argue, no, we need to think carefully about how we do it. That's but, but John, but John isn't, isn't the case for discretion versus rules here a question of how much you trust the individual proposer? 
to actually get it accurately versus making their case. And I, I think, I think maybe, Kess, you can speak a little bit about it. I mean, the, the model which has each separate department do their own thing seems to, you know, ignore the issue that the departments implicitly essentially become advocates for their topic, right? The EPA likes the environment a lot more than other stuff that goes on. The Treasury <laughs> likes the economy a lot. Housing and urban development likes cities, right? These things, these things are there. They're not, they're not in any sense balancing stuff off. And I thought the point of something like, doing it in OIRA rather than saying, oh, EPA, you just do your stuff and we'll trust you to get the discount rate right and the VSL right and so forth, is that you have sort of an honest broker who can be in the middle. Yes, and notice on the discount rate, it's not OIRA. It's a government policy that had multiple actors. I don't even know what OIRA's view was on the 3 or 7%. So it was an interagency process that included uh, peers, meaning economists. So the the danger with the, the Coates system, as we're describing, and he's, he's completely right that this would be within the cost-benefit framework, is that different agencies would have very different discount rates, and explanation of why they should be different might be hard to generate. So the, the view has been that the U.S. government should have a policy with respect to discount rates. The technocrats there, which includes professional economists, they are good with the 3 and 7%. It might be wrong, and it maybe should be reopened, but to allow it to be reopened on an ad hoc basis by individual agencies, uh, it's not clear that would make for fewer errors. It, it might. Even if they were, as I think they would be required to both state and publicize and submit themselves to public and political <coughs> criticism for choosing a crazy rate. Well, and the, if you don't believe <laughs> that, that is, yes then why do we trust them on other equally judgmental, difficult inputs to the model, like the kinds of things I was gesturing at, right? How to design a survey that would then produce a number that would be an input. And we're, I assume the answer there is we count on the public pressure to keep them from doing crazy surveys. Why not the same thing in this case? Well, for surveys, the, um, there is an interagency process. And subject to something like the, I'm not sure if this is too technical for you all, but their surveys are subject to guidance documents that discipline what they can look like. A survey doesn't just go because one agency wants it. There's going to be input from multiple government actors, including data specialists, survey specialists. So there will be an interagency process. Surveys are not you know, within agency domain under the Paperwork Reduction Act, they're subject to intensive scrutiny. But a, a, a number for a survey is harder to come up with than for discount rates. The Office of Management Budget th thinks about discount rates every year. Uh, there hasn't been a formal rethinking of the 3 and 7 percent, but that is completely available. Yeah, just, just um, you know, the, there is a uh, uh, just in terms of coming up with the, the things doing the individual agencies. I, I think if you if you took anything that was a, a common currently non-quantifiable. In some sense, I'd like to see the same type of process that went through with the discount rate and or the value of a statistical life. To, so if we if we actually wanted to know what the value of a statistical rate was, it would be something that I wouldn't want just to send to DOJ. It would be something where you'd want a, a large-scale political debate. And the other thing, just to, just to support John's point on this, the natural alternative to 3 and 7 is not, you know, everybody, everybody does it themselves. It's like the 30 year bond rate, T bond rate plus some, some risk adjustment, right? That's the, that's the, the net, which would, which would allow it some degree of flexibility over time without, you know, without an enabling any flexibility at the department level. I'll give you one example, which I th think will be interesting, which is the value of statistical life is actually not set by an OIRA contributed process. The circular says the numbers that the data suggests is between 1 million and 10 million. That's quite out of date, that 1 to 10 million dollar range, but, and it doesn't even dictate that it be within that range. It just says that. Now, the Department of Transportation was an outlier in the Obama administration, it had been around 6 million, where the state-of-the-art view is 9 million, and there was internal governmental interest in getting the department to, to update its number to get higher. Now, that uh, you might be suspicious of that because there's some implicit sense, I believe, that not, around 9 million is, is state-of-the-art, and the department had been a third lower. The department, not unaware that the rest of government thought their number was too low given the state of art, relatively recently updated it so that it's with, not within line with something that's a dictate like the 3 and 7%, but in line with an intergovernmental judgment. 
Now that has a different valence, I guess, from the discount one. It's that you, but it supports, I think, uh, Ed's suggestion that you know the Department of Transportation is at six, EPA is at nine. Why is that? U.S. government is going to have six million dollar value for a little kid hurt in a in a crash by a parent, and nine million for an old person hurt going dying because of particulate matter. Does that make any sense? And and now the department is in line with EPA. If there's an interest that's worth more than life by reference to something that's intelligible, then that's completely open for discussion. The only thought would be that there are plenty of things that are worth less than, <laughs> and, and, and that's enough to get going. radicalized by some experience in prison. It's not, it's a hypothetical case. I mean, consider the case where uh, a, GIA, a, a prisoner in, in a prison is, is uh, <clears throat> abused and as a result, uh, instead of becoming pacified, becomes a jihad. Becomes <coughs> a, uh, you know, a, a, a radical, Terrorist organization. How, 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 don't you have to add that kind of uh, contingency, you know, down the road contingencies, in, into a cost benefit analysis? Sure. I mean, the, the full range of possible outcomes should, in principle, be taken on board. No question. I hope that one isn't high probability in ordinary well, prisons. I, I don't know whether that's, that, that's, that, that, uh, what the illustration is correct. I think it is. It's a long time ago that I read this book. Adrian. So, this is sort of a question for Cass, maybe also a bit for Ed. Um, you both appear at various points to various methods for aggregating judgments of value. So, Cass, you refer to the median and contingent valuation surveys, uh, market studies aggregate observations across people, judgments of value. There's a whole other family of methods for aggregating judgments of value that we call voting. I was wondering if voting is a method for aggregating judgments of value that, that you should use, although I got the sense that both of you felt a little bit skeptical about uh, at least large-scale voting, democratic voting, as, as a method of that sort. Um, I'm not sure why. So uh, compared to contingent valuation surveys and market data, um, Voting might more accurately express people's valuations. I mean, my valuations for saving the endangered squirrel might be different if I know that other people are going to be forced to contribute to saving the endangered squirrel, not just me, um, and so on like that. So can you say something about democratic voting as a valuation method? And can you say something about why it's not, not on the table? OK, in, in some contexts, voting might be have advantages, so completely right. Uh, and you're also right that the valuation judgment might be affected by whether you know that other people are going to be doing it too. And in cases where that's so, which is the regulatory context, that is the right question. How much would you pay given that other people are doing it rather than in isolation where it's a collective good or something? Uh, the reason voting on one view isn't uh, uh, equal to the cost-benefit analysis of the humanized sort I'm trying to describe is that it uh, doesn't give you information about the human consequences. It's too coarse-grained. 
So if you put to people the question, do you want uh, a rule that reduces the prison rape, uh, they might say no, or they might say yes in a way that wouldn't give us a fix on the precise levels of reduction that might be imagined and what their effects would be. Or so too for an occupational safety and health rule. Do you want one that reduces levels of exposure to silica in general industry? For one thing, that's basically an unintelligible question to put to vote. So to make it intelligible, you have to inform people about a ton of things. There are probably four words there that just don't have clear reference. And once you start informing them, that's a, a, a very burdensome exercise. And it turns you know, a representative government into more like a referendum government in an area where the referendum is uh, not super promising just because you have to give, give so many details. And my, my speculation is once you give them the right level of detail such that the decisions will be informed, you'll be getting exactly what would emerge from a good cost-benefit analysis. And so you should just do that. Yeah, just, you know, my, my point about uh, OIRA versus politicians was actually meant to be just on that. I mean, we do have this, have this electoral veto over anything OIRA or any economist come up, which in some, some sense is, is giving, you know, is, is giving votes power. I guess I, I typically think about this as the point of cost benefit analysis is to inform voters and politicians rather than to be the unilateral end of the, end of the day, uh, thing. But I think in, in practice, one way to see at least the, what OIRA did is that voters actually wanted to delegate some of this authority. They actually weren't able to sort of, didn't, they didn't want to look over the thousands of things the government did, and they wanted to put some sort of a check which said that unless you make a special deal of it by going to Congress, we'd like this rule of thumb put in, which sort of tells you that we're, we're in a world in which transaction costs are high enough that handing it off to, you know. Let me give an example that may, I'm wondering if it'll move people who are moved by Adrian's question or maybe make Ed be a little more pro-cost benefit analysis than he just was. <laughs> There's only one case I'm aware of that was issued in the last six years or so where the benefits were clearly d lower than the costs. So this, I'm about to describe the only loser, clear loser on cost benefit grounds. It's called a positive train control rule. And what it does is it requires the railroads to install very expensive equipment to make sure that they can stop faster. And it was prompted by a well-publicized uh, accident, train accident. On any account of the numbers, this is a terrible loser on cost-benefit grounds. It's really, really expensive, and the benefits don't come close to the cost. Uh, so on human welfare grounds, you have to do some fancy footwork to describe why America is better off. You have things that are quite safe, Amtrak, et cetera, and they're a tiny bit safer, but in a way that's not going to affect very many people. Uh, why did Congress do that? I'm not sure that what, what voters think about that. They maybe are for it if it's presented in a certain way. The reason was there was an accident and something had to be done about it, and this seemed to be technologically feasible, so go for it. Many of the members of Congress who voted for this rule uh, have been protesting against the Obama administration vigorously, saying, don't issue this rule, but the law required it. And on, on human welfare grounds, this may be as a testimony to the superiority of at least some effort to get a hold of the human consequences rather than submit to a vote. Uh -huh. I mean, we're talking a lot about putting a numerical value upon things that are essentially values in a sort of moral sense base. And I would, I, I would uh -huh. be curious to see how, how that sort of change in values is going to take here in, say, the EU. Uh, oh. Would it work or, or, or does it influence the actual either method or the substantial say, numbers or just you know, the substantial method by which it um, I haven't studied this lately, but I co-chaired the High-Level Regulatory Cooperation Council with the EU, and my sense was there was a growing international consensus in favor of uh, some form of cost-benefit analysis in a way that is highly quantitative. And uh, the Europeans have often liked something called the precautionary principle. That seems to be moving in the direction of some form of cost-benefit analysis, maybe under the, the pressure of the financial crisis. 
if by the states you mean uh, the American states, like our New York and California and Massachusetts and localities, Ed and I have been working hard on this issue. And we're very concerned that at the state and local level, there's a lot of stuff going on which couldn't be sustained by careful analysis. It's imposing real costs on real people, including poor people, and uh, no one's given a careful screen. So uh, one thing I think is a real mission for the next decade, maybe, is that the cost-benefit idea, as opposed to the units of educational, pre-K education for disadvantaged kids, it looks kind of cold and harsh. But there are people all over the United States who want to cut hair or who want to be interior designers who don't have jobs, who have some talent and skill, who, who can't do anything because there's a regulatory barrier to their doing what is their dream. And to have some kind of state-level screen, there is not strong movement yet for that. But uh, hope springs eternal. David. So, Cass, and Chris are both fascinating. Um, I guess I want to know how, as a regulator, you incorporate what Ed said about all the limitations that we know are in these numbers, and you prevent them from simply just being looked at at the bottom line as a kind of data conflict, right? I mean, Ed went through 10 things that, you know, how risk averse are you, how this, how that, but you know where they are. It doesn't seem to me to destroy the value of the exercise, but I do think it puts responsibility on the people who are going to say, and therefore this means that that they're speaking in a way that they're adding more certainty to this than they know is there. I suppose the counterbalancing thing is, of course, if you say, well, this is the best we can do, but we're actually completely unsure about any <coughs> input that's gone in there, then are you going to get the power out of it? So how do you do that in terms of how these get transferred? In, in the real world of government, and this is speaking you know, broadly over the last 30 years, it seems to me the, the, the problem is not how do you build in an understanding of the limited, limits of the numbers. The problem is how do you insist on the central importance of the numbers so as to uh, drive out a feeling of what do the interest group thinks, how will the press react, how will... Um, the opposing political party react? Will this rec be received? Will this help them with the midterms? Those are the questions that it's better to subordinate. And the numbers are great insulation. So I'll tell you a little story. There was one rule that had you know, positive benefit cost numbers and it's going to save some lives. No one in this room has heard of it. Small, but some people are alive today because of it. And uh, uh, people were for it partly for the reason I just gave, but in a, in a meeting in the White House, not someone you would have heard of, but an official with some stature said to me, uh, who's going to, uh, what's the public reaction going to be? And I said, none. And he said, will anyone applaud? We're going to get some positive press out of this? I said, no. And he looked at me with great skepticism and he said, why the, are we doing this? <laughs> and I said, because it's a good thing to do. And so the, the limits of quantification seem to me not the central appropriate focus. But of course you're right. And the, the, the way to do it is to have benefit ranges and cost ranges. So the, the good numbers, and they're all over the regulatory impact analyses, don't have a point estimate. They have a range. And I just want to make it clear that I, I certainly could not agree more with that. That, that you know the big fight is to have more of this stuff, not less of it. And I, and I started including those the downsides because I was actually arguing that a wider range of things could be quantified in the same way that we already do. Uh, so let me get my last minutes on that one. If you go that route, then implicit in what Cass is saying, but I submit practically very difficult for the reason David's suggesting. The agency ought, if they're going to inform the public, say this range is not only a range. But the method is inherently got the following 11 problems. And therefore, had we redone this with slightly different 
technocrats, we would have gotten a totally different range, and therefore our judgment about the rule might very well be wrong. Now, if you say that in those words, you, you, which is the truth, all right, and if you can't say it in those words, this is my pushback for you. I'm not so sure you're increasing transparency. What you may be doing is encouraging the agencies to be more opaque. That's a great point. Uh, one of the most interesting rules in the last 20 years, I think, is the Food and Drug Administration's rule requiring graphic health warnings for cigarette packages. You probably haven't seen those graphic health warnings that were required by the FDA. And the reason is that the court invalidated them. And the court invalidated them as not adequately justified by evidence. And one of the things the court pointed to was an extremely honest and transparent explanation by the FDA of the limits of its data analysis. So the FDA said, we're basing this on candidate studies. It's a before and after picture. We haven't been able to control for confounding variables. Our estimates of the health impacts are subject to assumptions that we don't have complete confidence in. That was great. I think that they did that. Uh, it did not help in federal court. And that that is a problem for our legal system, I think. The transparency about the lack of clarity in uh, some of the assumptions creates a risk of invalidation. I have a question about cost-benefit analysis in the foreign policy context. Um, doesn't that analysis kind of require you to calculate the cost of an American life versus the life of someone in country X? I mean, is there a way to do that in a non-arbitrary way? You, you write about this blank, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 on, for, on foreign policy, I defer to my spouse. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, well, I can, I can just answer, it. yes, it would. And, and, of course, following the previous thing for the answer to this, I will submit to the voters uh, in terms of the value of the American life versus, versus someone, else, someone else. Because, obviously, the, the voters feel very differently about this than I would say. Or they appeared. Thank you. Uh, this is the end of our time, uh, but thank you all for coming and thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.